What if the fuel tank simply exploded of its own accord? Flights across the Atlantic to Europe carry most of their fuel in the wing tanks. The center tank is almost empty, full of air and vapor instead. Having a little bit of fuel, 50 um, to uh, 100 gallons of fuel, is exactly what you're looking for um, if you indeed have temperatures the right way to produce an explosive vapor. If things got hot enough in the tank, could the air vapor mix become so volatile that it could explode? The plane had been sitting on the tarmac for three hours and 48 minutes prior to departure. The outside temperature at Kennedy Airport was 81 degrees. The plane's air conditioning packs had been going full blast, and they're located right beneath the fuel tank. The tank is effectively sitting on a hot plate. Here we have the ductwork coming in from the engines, 350 degrees. Here we have one of the air conditioning packs. Some of the ducting in these air conditioning packs get hotter than that. That one right there gets up to 390 degrees. What we found was that immediately over all these sources of heat, we have the fuel vapors. Just as it seemed the NTSB were onto something important, there was a sensational development. In the cabin wreckage were found three separate traces, or hits, of plastic explosive. It was the moment that Jim Kallstrom had been certain would come. Surely, evidence of a bomb. From a scientific and an objective standpoint, there were some very serious considerations that uh, I think argued against that, not the least of which is these hits, from what I understand from the explosive residue chemists, uh, two of the three were, are not found together in the same explosive, that, suggesting that it had to be two different kinds of explosives. From a material standpoint, they were also in regions that, did not, that showed no uh, appropriate material behavior or deformation or damage. By the time uh, that information came to light, um, we had a fair amount of the wreckage of that airplane and it was very, very clear we did not have a bomb that exploded inside that airplane. I knew that. I mean, I knew that, absolutely knew that in my heart. Dr. Loeb's instincts were right. The minute traces of explosive had oozed out of packets planted aboard the aircraft months earlier. They'd been used to train sniffer dogs. For the FBI, it was a moment of high embarrassment. The little town of Montoursville in Pennsylvania held its breath. 16 of their children and the five adults who accompanied them had been on the plane. They were members of the high school French club. It was their first trip to Paris and for many of them, their first time on an airplane. Coping with the loss of his 15-year-old daughter, Michelle, was harrowing for Jeff Bowling. For him and other families, the internet had brought a kind of solace, allowing them to correspond easily with each other, to share their grief. But gradually, the electronic message board began to reveal its darker side well-meaning, if crazy, suggestions as to the cause of the accident had been pouring in on the net. It gave demented people a, a chance to try to spread misinformation. So many conspiracy theorists uh, were using this website that the webmaster set up a separate conspiracy page for those people to exchange their their ideas. Now these took a more sinister turn. From out of the ether came the startling accusation that the United States Navy had shot down the plane. Suddenly it was all over the net. The story that the guided missile destroyer, the USS Normandy, had fired a missile at the TWA plane. 
The Navy, which until this moment had been heroes for their incredible recovery and salvage operation, was now reviled. I would just like to say that there were no Department of Defense assets, either air, ground, sea, or undersea, which launched any missiles or ordnance. I think that this is a bunch of baloney. I will answer that question in English. Uh, we're not sure it got worse. No less a person than Pierre Salinger, President Kennedy's former press secretary, came forward to say that he'd seen secret military documents. That 154 people living in the Long Island area where the missile testing was going on saw one or two missiles rising in the air. When P.S. Salinger came into the game, it ratcheted the whole thing up to a new dimension. I mean, it had been around, this whole business of conspiracies and the U.S. government. It had been around, but it never had, it, had a spokesman who was the press secretary to the President of the United States. When I first heard that, I was just totally flabbergasted. And my first response was, you know, maybe he knows something that we need to know. Maybe he has some information. Salinger's theory centered on an air traffic control radar tape that showed an unidentified blip crossing the path of the plane. Also, a document which he claimed French intelligence had obtained from the US Navy, stating that the area around the crash scene was being used for unspecified military maneuvers that night. A huge investigation of the Navy is launched. I called up the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and he said it didn't happen. That was not good enough. I didn't question the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. I didn't think he was lying to me for a second. But we had to independently say it wasn't so. 10,000 people would have to take place in this conspiracy to keep this quiet. We looked at all the satellite imagery. We looked at the ordnance on the ship, the Normandy. It was all accounted for. And by the way, the ordnance could not fly that far. We know exactly where the ship was. It was 185 miles south of the tragedy. The missiles can only go 100 miles. So technically, it couldn't reach TWA. And guess what? If they fired a missile that size, it would be obvious on radar because it's a big missile. And we wouldn't be looking at little holes in the plane the size of dimes and quarters. If a missile from the USS Normandy hit the plane, it would demolish the plane. And evidence, metallurgy evidence, would be everywhere. People wouldn't be looking at little pieces and 10 times and saying, geez, I wonder. It would slap you across the face. We want to assure the American public. We want to assure the families of the victims of this horrendous tragedy that nothing, nothing, like that would ever take place see, under any circumstances. The Navy is a suspect. Let's go. Come on. Oh, wow. oh, Remove him. Remove him. No matter what the FBI said, a large number of people now believed that the government was covering up a dark secret. Conspiracy theories flourished and were to be given a massive shot in the arm by the disturbing story of Lance and Linda Cabot. On the night of the 17th, they were at a party at a restaurant on the coast. Linda, a professional photographer, was taking snapshots. It was about half past eight, the time that unknown to her, Flight 800 was passing overhead. A week later, the Cabots picked up the developed photos. I look through the images because we had just gotten them developed and so I glanced through just to see that everything exposed okay and Lance looked over my shoulder and you know into the set of images and said what's that as we got to one image that had a lot of the skyline in the frame and I really said there's nothing there I don't see anything there Lance uh, said there's definitely an object there I don't know what he thought he saw there but I really didn't think it was anything more than maybe dust or uh, an anomaly in the developing process or something like a scratch on the negative. Lance couldn't let it rest. He saw something. He took the negative back to the local Photoshop in West Hampton Beach and had an enlargement made of the part of the sky containing the object. It confirmed his suspicions and he decided he should report it to the FBI. 
One of the agents who was out on the lead came into the command post, the trailer, with a photograph, a color photograph of, um, in the background, up in the sky, of something in the right-hand corner, cylindrical in shape, that had a flame or plume uh, uh, to it. We were really taken aback. We got goosebumps. We kept staring at the photo, kept looking at it. We called in uh, one of the other SACs, take a look at this, what do you think? It represented to us, at least at that time, that perhaps somebody had captured in, in just a split second a projectile in the sky. The day after my husband had turned over the photograph and negative to the FBI, they requested that I meet them here at Dockers to retrace my footsteps to determine what direction I was facing when I took the image in question. And so I did so, and in facing this way, it was determined that I was facing north and eastward at a one o'clock heading. Since Linda was facing north and the crash took place over the ocean due south, the FBI concluded that the photograph was not relevant, even though they could not decide what the object was. Public distrust of the government had deepened with the Cabot photograph. By now, one year after the accident, huge numbers of people were convinced that there was a sinister reason for the death of Flight 800. investigation in FBI history was over. Despite millions of dollars and millions of man hours, they had found not a trace of a bomb or missile. It was now up to the NTSB. They undertook a staggering task to rebuild the plane. I really didn't dream that we would rebuild 90 feet of the airplane, um, which we have. It's uh, clearly the largest reconstruction that's ever been done in any aviation accident investigation. The NTSB was still working on the theory that heat from the air conditioning units could have brought the vapor in the central fuel tank to flashpoint and caused it to explode. Boeing thought it was impossible. To find out, the NTSB flew an identical plane simulating all the conditions of TWA-800 and placed 92 temperature sensors in the tank. They found that the tank heated up to extraordinary levels, in places to 127 degrees Fahrenheit. Shaken, Boeing said that even if vapor did explode, it would not be powerful enough to bring down a 747. Boeing had um, uh, indicated to us early on that they didn't believe that a simple explosion, um, unaided by some kind of um, explosive charges or uh, other event, uh, simply a fuel air explosion in the, um, in the center tank could create the pressures that would be needed um, to fail the airplane. But the NTSB had worked on an earlier accident in the Philippines where the central fuel tank had exploded and blown the roof off the aircraft. If it had been in the air instead of on the ground, it would have been catastrophic. The truth was, very little was known about the properties of Jet A, the sort of aviation fuel used by most commercial airliners. The NTSB started a series of tests. To their alarm, when they ignited the fuel, they found that the blast was three times the force needed to destroy a plane. It 
it became vital to understand exactly how an explosion in the fuel tank would bring the plane down, to work out the sequence of events that would end with the 747 in a million pieces. Jim Wildy, the NTSB's top metallurgist, was confronted with the world's biggest jigsaw puzzle. Where was he to begin? The first clue to the breakup sequence was a series of pieces, mainly across the top of the fuselage, that had a series of curls on them. These pieces uh, started on the right side of the airplane with a big curl on this piece and progressed across the top of the airplane all the way over to the left side. And this indicated that there was a series of pieces that broke off across the top of the airplane sequentially from the right side to the left side, ending at the window belt. Evidence found on the reinforcing beams of the central fuel tank supported the theory of an explosion there. The bay in front of the tank is a dry bay right here without fuel, and we noticed some very interesting features. Right here on the back side of the front spar was a series of witness marks that went all the way across the back side of the front spar. These witness marks indicated that Spanwise Beam 3 broke at the top, rotated forward, and impacted the, uh, the back of the front spar. This is as a result of an overpressure event or an explosion inside the wing center section fuel tank. The challenge now was to try to understand the relationship between the explosion in the wing center section fuel tank and the breakup of the fuselage, especially going across the top. To do that, we examined all the fracture patterns along the rivet lines inside the lower portion of the fuselage. We found that this fracture right here was the very first fracture, and the cracking progressed from here forward and then around the fuselage and broke out all these pieces. This fracture was the very first one and it's right adjacent to the wing center section. The NTSB stages the biggest ever hearing into an airline disaster. After 18 months of investigating TWA 800, they were ready to give their definitive account of the events of that night. They had prepared a dramatic computer animation of the flight. As the plane climbs away from Kennedy Airport, the fuel vapors in the center wing tank are at a flashpoint. At 13,800 feet, a spark ignites the vapors, causing an explosion. In a quarter of a second, the center of the plane is unzipped, causing the heavy nose to break off. The center of gravity shifts back, what's left of the plane tilts up. With the engine still under power, it climbs another 2,000 feet before stalling. Flight 800 is now in a 17,000-foot death dive. As it gathers speed, the stresses on the wings become too great. They snap off, releasing thousands of gallons of fuel. This is the first time they have been confronted with what happened to their families aboard the plane. We all have visions of what our family members experienced when that plane fell apart at 17,500 feet. And our greatest fears are that they didn't die immediately, that they knew what was happening, and that they experienced pain and fear over the process of the investigation, I have always hoped that I would be able to find some indication that they died immediately. But unfortunately, everything that I see, and all indications are because they were sitting in the back of the plane, that they didn't die immediately, that they knew what was happening. And the terror that they must have experienced is something that I just can't get out of my head. This tragedy has led to a complete re-examination of the way the families of the victims are treated after an accident. 
If we're not doing this investigation for the individuals and the families who lost lives in the accident, who are we doing the investigation for? Our nation owed to each one of them uh, the same type of uh, support and assistance we provide routinely in this country uh, for, uh, for major disasters. So legislation was passed by, uh, by the Congress and signed uh, by the President that now gives the Family Assistance responsibility to coordinate those services to the NTSB. To skeptical members of the public, there remained one big unanswered question. Why did so many people report seeing a bright light climbing into the sky, followed by the sound of an explosion? CIA analysts were called in to examine all the witness statements. CIA's conclusion? The eyewitnesses did not see a missile. What the witnesses saw, the analysts say, was the burning remains of the plane as it climbed 2,000 feet into the sky. The boom that followed was the noise of the initial fuel tank explosion that had taken place 49 seconds earlier. The sound waves had taken that long to reach the shore. It was a simple case of light traveling faster than sound. After the hearing, FBI Chief Jim Kallstrom took early retirement. Despite the fact that he's now convinced that no bomb or missile was involved, he has refused to officially close the investigation, leaving it pending inactive, just in case. But whilst everyone now agrees that it was an explosion in the fuel tank, there remains a mystery. There's another piece to the puzzle, and that is if, if the fuel um, uh, air vapor was in fact explosive, what ignited it? What was the source of ignition? All the NTSB's efforts are now bent on trying to find that ignition source, the vital spark which caused the explosion. There are some 150 miles of wiring on the 747. Some of them run through the center fuel tank itself to power the fuel probes. They carry a very low voltage, insufficient to cause a spark. But outside the tank, it's a different story. This is the actual wiring harness that contains the wiring for the center tank of the 747. Behind me is the forward spar, and we're in the forward cargo compartment. However, notice in the same wiring bundle, we have generator cables running in from an engine inches away, not right in contact, but inches away. We have, as we counted, close to 400 other power wires routed with the center tank wires, giving the capability for a potential short circuit, putting power into the center tank wires from another system. The suspicion now is that a short circuit in an adjoining high voltage cable sent a powerful current down the wires that go into the fuel tank. If they were corroded, it could be enough to cause a spark. The TWA jet was 25 years old. When the NTSB inspected other aircraft of a similar age, they were horrified by the state of the wiring. Such is the concern about this deadly combination of fuel vapor, heat and electricity that operators of older 737s, 747s, and 767s have been ordered to check their air corroded wiring. This search is aviation's most pressing task, to find the tiny spark that can destroy the biggest passenger airplane in the world. Trying to find the source of ignition in a fire explosion is just extraordinarily difficult. The very act of the explosion eliminates the evidence that you need to determine what ignited it. It is entirely possible that at the end we will not be able to determine what ignited the, uh, the vapors.